Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6 this morning, is the feast that I get to lay before you. It is the meal that I got to work over all week, and I am ready, and I am excited for you to join me in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Brothers and sisters, I love hearing those pages turn, and now I delight that you get to hear from your Father. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, once again, your word is clear because you are clear. Father, once again, your word is authoritative to our lives because you are the authority over our lives. Father, once again, your word is living and active because your spirit works through it. And so, Father, we are ready to be examined by your word and to be shown the Lord Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. If you're new with us, my name is Jeremy. I get to serve as a pastor here at Trinity Church, and it's my privilege to walk you through the Word this morning. We have been in the Gospel of Matthew for a really long time now, and we're going to be here for a very long time, and we're still in the Sermon on the Mount, or what has Jesus done to you? But he looked at you and said, come here. Come here. Sit down on the hillside. We're going to talk. I'm your new authority, and I love you. And I am going to order your life according to my plan. And now we're with this Jesus looking at you all the way in chapter 7. And he says, here's another way my good order will come into your life. And do you remember what he's pushing against in your life? He says, look, Jeremy and everybody here, you have a default tendency to be like the Pharisees. And all the way back in chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus looked at you and he said, do not be like them. Do not be like the Pharisees. I'm judging them right now. Do not slide into their camp. And listen to me, you will by default. You love to be a Pharisee. And I'm going to pry that out of your hand, your heart, and your mind. And this morning, Jesus comes along and says, here's one more way. You're going to model me in the kingdom, and you're not going to model the way of the Pharisees. Now, when we get to a text like this, you see how it begins there, right there in chapter 7, the first verse, you're looking at it. Judge not that you be not judged. Now hear me. Everything in me this week wants to do a 45-minute sermon on why this is the most misunderstood verse in the entire Bible, and number two, why this is the most horribly quoted, out-of-context verse in your Bible. That's all I want to do. And for 45 minutes, I want to rip on how people misuse this verse. And trust me, that sermon is downloaded right here. We're not doing that today. We're not. Why? Because that's not what the text is about. If I spend all my time on my favorite hobby horse of how this verse is abused, and I will touch on it just a little bit, we will miss the treasure in this verse where Jesus doesn't tell us to yell at how other people use the verse, this morning he's saying, no, 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 no. I'm interested in how you use this teaching. And so just know, I know that exists, and I'm going to touch on it to a bit. But as you walk through this text, you're going to see five main things from Jesus this morning. First, he's going to show you that judgment is a weighty matter. And I'll come back to all of these things throughout our sermon. Judgment is a weighty matter. And second, he's going to say to you, Judgment has to be measured. You need to know how to measure. Third, he's going to look at you and say, judgment starts internally. Before you judge out there, 
Jeremy, Jeremy, you've got to do the work of judgment in here. Fourth, he's going to say to you in this text, judgment always seeks to serve. Biblical judgment has a heart of service. And then fifth, he's going to land the plane with saying that judgment has standards. Your judgment cannot just float up in the air. It actually has to have standards. So let's look at the first one as we bring ourselves into conformity with Christ. Number one, judgment is a weighty matter. Look at the verse, verse one. Judge not that you be not judged. See what he's saying? Watch it. Do you know what you're dealing with when you and I start to walk in judgment? Do you know what realm you're treading in? And what is he getting at? Judge not that you be not judged. Okay, if you judge, a judgment's going to be modeled after that. Okay, tread lightly. Because in judgment, you're getting the realm of authority. And if you're a Christian following Jesus, who has the ultimate authority to judge but the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? And so he's saying, look, judgment exists. You need to know this. He has no problem with that. But you better feel the weight of that. Because now you're stepping into God's realm. And there's a greater judgment than whatever judgment you're going to give. It is the equivalent of a six-year-old looking at a parent and saying, I want the guinea pig. I want it. I want the guinea pig. I want the guinea pig, Daddy. Does that kid have any idea what they're getting into? You have no idea how much food it takes. You have no idea how much food comes out of it. You have no idea how much cleaning it takes. Uh, you, you do not know what you're talking You have no idea what you're talking about right now. And Jesus is saying, when, when you step into judging, whoo, tread lightly. You are now in God's territory. And number two, when he says right here, judge not that you be not judged, what is he saying? But do you know that the people you're judging are made in God's image? Man, slow down a second. That person you're about to say something against, who made them? And, and you may be 100% right, but tread lightly. There's somebody who has a better glimpse of who they are and a better glimpse of what they're doing. Feel the weight of stepping into judgment. Judge not lest or that you not be judged. And so if you want to get a little nerdy with me, if you want to circle judge there in your Bible and you want to break it down in three sections, I know you do. I know you do. You're going to. You're going to circle it and you're going to go one, two, three. Judge can mean a few things. First, judgment can mean that you're just discerning. Look, I'm, I'm taking in information and I'm analyzing information. That, that's really good. Second, judgment here in this verse can mean that I'm going to decide something. So I'm done discerning. I've decided the information I've discerned. Or the Bible can use the word judge here to mean a final condemnation. And trust me, you know the difference. You know when you're just discerning, you know when you're just deciding, and you know when you're making a final determination of condemnation. And here, Jesus is saying, you need to think wisely and slowly when you walk in judgment. Now, I teased this earlier. This is one of the most horribly quoted verses in the Bible. There will be people who don't know a single verse in the Bible, but all of a sudden, you'll say something, and what are they going to say back to you? Judge not lest ye be judged, which is hilarious. You can't quote three other Bible verses, and all of a sudden, you know the King James. Okay, So I'm not impressed. You know ye be judged, but you don't know five other verses, do you? But you got that one locked and loaded. And so Jesus is saying here, not, well, I have no opinion. Just, you know, just go your life and just don't make a judgment and do whatever you want. He is not saying that. And how do I know that? Well, just keep reading. Look at verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy and throw your pearls before pigs. Jesus expects you to have a category of person who are dogs and pigs. And we'll get more into that later. So he's not saying check your brain at the door. And if you keep going all the way down to verse 16, he says this, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He goes on to this whole story about you can know somebody by their fruit. And if they have good fruit, they're of me. And if they have bad fruit, they're of their father, the devil. You 
can discern that, and you have a brain, and it's okay to do that according to God's holy standards. So Jesus is not jumping in with 2022 and saying, you do you. You do you. As long as it doesn't mess with anybody else, we're all okay. He's not saying that. What is he saying? That judgment is a weighty matter. And when you step into discern, decide, or condemn, you better do it before God's holy face. Now listen to this. One author notes, I think very helpfully here around this, Jesus is getting at where we can make a mistake of judgment. Three ways it'll show up. First, we can be self-righteous. Don't you feel the weight of this one when you make a judgment against somebody? I mean, if you're just, just are you honest with yourself right now? Be honest. Look in your past week, criticisms you've made about other people. Is there a hint of self-righteousness in that? That we are wholly free from our sin, but boy, do I see her sin. Do you ever have it in your judgments where you are hypercritical? This is mine, right here. This is me. I am hypercritical, which means I can see it in excess in somebody in a second, but I would never have that much clarity in myself. I can easily be hypercritical. And another one he highlights is when it says, judge not lest ye be judged. It's because we can be so destructive in our judgments. Do, do your judgments of others seek to build them up or to just step back and watch the house get a little more fire in it? Some of us are pyromaniacs throwing gas on an already smoldering fire because we like it and it makes us feel better. You know what that's called? The Pharisees and the hypocrites. And Jesus loves us enough this morning to say, I've already seen what happens when you go that route. Now, you, you need to come to judgment through my lenses. Judge not that you be not judged. John Stott is an outstanding pastor. He has this great line about this verse. He says, in this command to judge not, ready? It is not a requirement to be blind. It's not a requirement to be blind. But rather, it is a plea from Jesus to be generous. That's what he's doing here. It is not a command to be blind, have an opinion, but it is a plea to be generous in your well formed opinions. And so that is what the Lord Jesus is doing this morning. He's saying, watch the weightiness of a posture of judgment. So look at what he does here in number two. Yes, that was just number one. Look at what he does here in verse two. He's going to tell you that judgment needs to be measured. He begins, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. He's saying, listen, the type of judgment and the measure of the judgment you use, hear me, it matters. Romans chapter 14, listen to verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, verse 11, as I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of God himself to God. Romans joins with Jesus and says, watch it in the measurement of your judgment. Why? Because there is a final judge. Know the temporary nature of your judgments. And Jesus is saying here, be measured because it's going to boomerang back to you. And the measure in which you look at somebody and have clarity, and the measure in which once you have clarity, you can jump down their throat, okay, okay, your father's watching, and know he's going to return that reciprocally when he judges you, when you come before his throne. How you judge now is no light matter. Now, do you see the error in this text right now? What are you doing? Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. So the way I judge is the way he's going to judge me. Sweet. Check it out. Everything's good to go. I'm going to go passive. I'm just... No. That would be a massive error. Jesus is going to call you to judge. But be mindful of this. 
my judgment and your judgments are to be measured. Look at what he does, number three. Now he's going to take these judgments, he's going to tell you to be measured, and he's going to turn them in on you in verse three. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? See what he's saying there? Wait, wait, wait a minute. So Jeremy, you show up here, you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye. He is saying here, confession comes before criticism. Confession comes before criticism. So wait a minute. And Jesus, I love this. He's using over-the-top language here. He's got this imagery of you're going up to your husband or your wife and sawdust in your eye. I can see it. Let me help you with that. As you're whipping around a log six feet out of your eye. So this last week, I was playing a game with my kids. It's called Ride the Bull. I'm the bull. They're riding. And what we do, and we started this when they were much younger, much younger. They get on my back. We go in the water, and I go from a scale of zero to ten. Start at zero, work my way up to ten. And their job is to stay on, which they cannot do. Now, this last week, they said to me, let's, let's play Ride the Bull, Dad. Well, they're a little older now, and I'm 40, okay? And we did this for an hour and 20 minutes out in Lake Michigan. Everything was fine until that night. My back and the muscle relaxers I'm on right now, which preclude me anything I say, I'm not accountable for today. It is a muscle relaxer talking. So my back is absolutely messed up, right? And I'm sitting here going, I, I need to go see the doctor. I didn't. I happen to have some pills, so I didn't go. But envision I go to my doctor, because my back hurts, I walk into my primary care physician in Zealand, I sit down, and the doctor walks in. And he's got a meat cleaver sticking out of his shoulder blade. And there's blood running down his body. What are you going to do in that moment? You're going to be like, well, that's interesting. Anyway, about my back, okay? It really hurts. Could I get a shot? Could I get some muscle relaxers? What? Every one of you would stop in that moment and go, um, hey, not, not to highlight the obvious, you have a meat cleaver sticking out of your shoulder, and it looks like it hurts, and there's blood. I don't even need to talk about me. Do you want to get that addressed by a nurse? And if your doctor said to you, no, I'm good. I mean, seriously, it's been here for a week. It's fine. I totally got used to it. It's fine. The blood's going to dry. I'm good. You'd be like, no, you're not. You're crazy. You need to get that addressed. And if you can't fix a meat cleaver coming out of your shoulder, I don't need you touching my back. I'll go to somebody else. You, you would know this in an instant. And Jesus says, that's me. That's you. If you would rather go to somebody else, look in their eye and go, I, I found something. Because let's be honest. You can find something in anyone because we're all broken. Look, look at it. I found some, some sawdust in your eye. But I have zero interest in doing that level of introspection in myself. And Jesus is saying this morning that before we judge externally, we get to be the kind of people who would rather do the hard work internally so that we might actually be helpful to our neighbors, to our friends, and to this world. Do you hear the gift that Jesus just gave you? He's like, look, you're, you're already loved. You're already forgiven. I know you have sin. I died for it. Do the hard work internally of, of getting those specks and logs out of your eye. Do that good hard work first. And then turn out and bless your neighbor. Matt Smuthrich, he's a pastor in Virginia. I really appreciate his work. He gives two examples of this. He says, just consider that you'd go to correct somebody because they're cursing and they tell off-color jokes. And you're like, okay, that's not appropriate. We shouldn't be talking like that. And you just, you just, you're going to call that out. Hey, hey, can't, can't be talking like that. But, but then you go back to your text thread on your phone. And if I just read your text thread, it's, it's nothing but that. But that's in private. He's going, that's what Jesus is talking about. If you can see clarity in your brother, make sure you see freedom from it in yourself. He gives the example, it'd be no different than having somebody pray in front of you, and you're in your head thinking, well, that was a, that was a silly prayer. That was a theologically inaccurate prayer. That was, that was a superficialist prayer. I mean, what was that prayer? But then personally, you haven't prayed in a week. You're not even interested. Jesus is saying, I want you in judgment, first to use it as a tool, 
to rid yourself of the sin that remains. To rid yourself of the hypocrisy and the blindness that can well up in you. And so Jesus here is saying, let's do some really good heart work. I want to give you Psalm 51, verse 10. This psalm is a great way to walk through this yourself. Psalm 51, beginning in verse 10. Hear these words. Create in me, says the psalmist, a clean heart. Yes, that's this. Hey, God, I want you to create in me. Before I look at anybody else, God, can I have a clean heart? God, I want it. Oh, God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51. God, before I talk to them, I need a heart. I need a spirit. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me, God. I need your spirit. I need your presence. Verse 12. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. Now listen to what the psalmist says next in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will return to you. You hear what the psalmist just said? God, first... I want the clean heart. I want your spirit in me. I want your presence. I want your spirit. I want the joy of salvation. I want a willing spirit. God, grow those things in me. And then, God, I will, once I've nurtured those things, I'm going to look right at transgressors. And I'm going to teach them your ways. And I'm going to delight that sinners return to you. Jesus is saying this morning, oh, there's going to be all kinds of judgment in the kingdom of God. But it's going to start with a weightiness with a measuredness, and it's going to start right here before it ever goes out there. Look at what he does, number four. In verses four to five, he's going to say that all of our judgment should seek to serve. Verse four, he says it this way, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's the log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. What is he saying? Listen, your judgment should always lead to the building up and restoring and serving of whoever you're judging. Now listen, you don't get to decide how they respond. You don't. But you get to decide what your intent is. And one of the things Jesus is saying this morning is, look, you can judge others, but the intent should be that you do the internal work so then you can do good external work on their heart and in their life. He says it right there. Then you will see. Verse 5. See what he's saying? I, I want you to see your brother's sin. I want you to know right from wrong. I want you to discern. I want you to judge. So that you then can come to them. And look at what it says. Take the speck. Notice, it wasn't a log. Hey, you got down to some nitty-gritty with somebody, didn't you? You saw a consistent speck in them and you pointed it out. Good job. What was your heart? Man, I want to free her from this and I want to help her take this speck out so that she might see Christ more. Judgment seeks to serve. J.C. Ryle, again, an excellent pastor, explains this very, very well. He says, listen, this kind of verse will crush in you a fault-finding spirit. I mean, be honest, are you critical? Do you enjoy the pleasure of finding fault? I mean, come on, be honest with yourself. Some of us love to go, well, that's wrong, that's a fault, why? So we can push somebody else down, so we can elevate ourselves up. It is so easy to build a reputation, to build a brand off of criticism. And J.C. Ryle is saying here, this verse comes along and says, if you have a fault-finding spirit, if you are ready to blame others for trifling offenses, for matters of indifference, Jesus is saying, I love you enough to free you from that. Do not go the way of the Pharisee. Don't do it. But also, what if some of us just have a habit of rash and hasty judgment? We just see things so clearly. And we love to just go, broken, sinner. I mean, do you know people like that? Where everything is just that quick, biting judgment. That, that doesn't build anyone up. Except the person speaking. And lastly, he just goes around here to say, some of us have a disposition where we love to magnify errors. 
We love to show the infirmities of our neighbor, and we love to make the worst of people. Why? Because internally you're miserable. Because internally you're bitter. Because internally, the gospel is not precious and sweet to you. And so what do you need? You need an artificial boost by evaluating yourself up off the failures of your neighbor. And look at me, we all do this, don't we? By default. And Jesus comes along and goes, okay, if you're speaking a word of discernment and judgment, it ought to seek to serve. And if there's anything else going on there, red light. Red light, warning light. Jeremy, you're going the way of the Pharisee. Now, lastly, look at how he ties it together for you here in verse 6. He says that judgment is going to have standards. Verse 6, do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What is he saying? Well, in that day, what were dogs? No, they were not your best friends sitting on your porch with your tail wagging with a nice little bandana that you bought over expensive toys for. That is not what dogs existed for. You didn't have a painting of them hanging up over your mantle in this day and age. Dogs were wild animals that roamed around in a trash. They had no human companionship in them. And same thing with pigs here. It's a wild boar. It's an animal of confusion and an animal of mess. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you an illustration, okay? You see these animals. They're out there, they're roaming around, and you got these pearls. you got these things of infinite value. What are those dogs and wild boars going to want to do? They're not going to know better, and they're going to want to eat them. They're going to see them and think they're food. You would not take your treasures and just throw them out to dogs and wild boars. You know they can't eat them. You know they're going to trample on them. You would not waste your treasures on animals that do not know how to use them properly. And this is where people don't quote this verse. It's funny, they quote the beginning of this, but nobody quotes this part. What is Jesus saying? Well, I've taught you to discern. I've taught you to know righteousness, right? There comes a time in your life where there are people who act as roaming wild dogs and uncontrollable swine and feel the weight of this. There are people who are defiant, persistently hateful, and they are vindictive against the gospel. And Jesus is saying, there does come a time. Don't engage. Hold back. This person has proven themselves repeatedly. Stop throwing your pearls at swine. What does the New Testament teach us? But Jesus sends out his disciples. And what does he say? If they will not receive you in this town, what are you to do? Cast off, dust off your feet in judgment. And go to the next town and see if they'll receive the message. So do you see the weightiness of Jesus here? You are to be gracious, kind, clear, uplifting in your judgment. But oh, you are to have a rod of steel of the righteousness of Christ. And there does come a point where you go, okay, no more. No, I'm not going to let you take advantage of me. I'm not going to let you bring this toxic ideology into our marriage, into our relationship, into our neighborhood. I'm going to build a good fence to make a better neighbor. Sorry, I'm drawing a line here. That is okay after you first sought their good, examined yourself, and walked in patience. Then watch out for these swine and for these dogs. And so what Jesus is saying here is this is our approach to judgment in the Christian life. In John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says this, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. You see the gift Jesus gave you there? He says, look, we're going to be free from judging each other by appearances. John 7, 24. But we are going to judge with right judgment. And what is that? With the righteousness and the teachings of Christ. So what a gift this morning. So we get to go into a culture that does not want to receive judgment. We get to go into a church context where, frankly, we don't want each other in our own business, do we? We don't. But what would it look like if there was a group of people who said, I've been walking with Jesus. And Jesus has been so kind and so compassionate and so good to me that I want to love you like Jesus has loved me. Consider this. 
How has Jesus judged you? Well, first, He judged you in truth. Jesus brought His perfect standard from God the Father to you. He didn't add to it. He didn't take away of it. He perfectly obeyed the law of God. He holds all of us to God's standard of truth. And then number two, Jesus has judged you with grace. He came towards us when we were a mess. He judges us with His unmerited favor. And then Jesus comes to you and He judges you with mercy. He says, watch this. You are not going to get what you deserve. You've miserably failed against God's holy standard, but I'll take your failure. I'll take God's judgment against you. And so Jesus says, look, I'm going to judge you in truth. I'm going to judge you in grace. I'm going to judge you with mercy. And I'm going to judge you with a selfless sacrifice. But I'm going to... I'm going to take every one of your sins. I'm going to place them on myself. And I'm going to carry them to that cross for you. And I will selflessly sacrifice myself to the point of death. And I will take on your judgment. Fifth, Jesus judged you for a redemptive purpose. Think about that. When Jesus judged you and He finds you short of His law, He goes, I'm not going to leave you where I found you. In my judgment, I'll redeem you. I'll purify you. I'll sanctify you. You just wait and watch where I'm going to get you by the time you get to heaven and you're glorified. You're not even going to recognize yourself because my judgment brings purification. My judgment brings righteousness. My judgment brings transformation. Watch what I'm going to do in you. And you just wait till the Holy Spirit takes over. You're not going to believe the conviction you come under. You're going to love it. My judgment is redemptive. Six. He judges you without any shame. Don't you love that? That he doesn't show up to you the next morning and go, hey, look look at it again. Look at it. Look at it. Look at what you did. I, 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 I saved you from that. Look at it. Say it out loud. Say it. He'll never do that to you. He says, I know what I judged you from. I know what I saved you from. That's mine now. Don't even look at it. Don't name that right now. You know why? Because it's mine. Don't take back from me what I already took from you. Jesus judges you and leaves you with no shame. And lastly, number seven, Jesus judges you with all humility. Jesus became like us in every respect without sin that we might become like Him. His judgment towards you was the greatest act of humility you will ever see. And so Jesus gathers you this morning. He says, come here. You're in me now. There's a new way of kingdom living. And I'm going to judge you in truth, grace, mercy, selflessly for redemption with no shame and in utter humility. And now, go do likewise. Have an opinion. Base it on righteousness. Do the internal work first. And then go serve this world who needs to know my Father's righteous standard." Friends, if we live those kind of lives, we will grow in holiness. Our joy will increase. And countless people are going to be judged. And they're going to love it. Because our judgment of them will bring them to Christ. And when they find the judgment of Christ, they will rejoice. That's who Jesus calls us to be. What a precious gift it is. Let's pray. Father, you are exactly that. You are a good and faithful Father. God, we thank you this morning again for the Lord Jesus who runs our lives, who is our authority. So Father, we want to be people who are deeply marked by this call of judgment. Lord, we confess as Ken already prayed this morning that we love to set up our own tribunals and our thrones. We love to exercise our swift and often so harsh of judgment. And yet, Father, we want to be free from that sin, free from that stain. So, Father, we turn to the mercy of Christ. Thank You for the judgment that we have found in Him this morning. The preciousness of His patience with us. God, thank You that does not leave our mind free of clarity of what is right and what is wrong. And so, Father, I pray for some of us We need to grow in that clarity and that conviction. Father, would you grow those who need to grow in that? 
who actually need to speak a word that's a, that's a little hard, that pushes a little bit. And Lord, for those who love to push hard, soften them. Show them Jesus. Give them a hand of tenderness. Lord, wherever we err in this, would you turn every one of us back to Christ, that He might be evident in our lives and in our judgments in this world. Father, we love You. And we pray this in Your holy name. Amen.